Uh, I asked last time how many actually knew this verse. Uh, there, can I see a raise of hand? You already know this verse? All right, there's some of you who don't know this verse. This is the most famous verse in the Bible. And if you're going to memorize any verse in the Bible, this is the verse you want to memorize. John 3.16. And I'd like you to say it with me as we're going to read it from the New International Version. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's an easy verse to memorize, right? Somebody said, it's not quite as easy as John 11.35. John 11.35 says, Jesus wept. All right, that's a short verse. But this is a very, very powerful verse, and we're going to talk a little bit about it as time, time goes on here. We've been looking at the stories of Jesus, <clears throat> the parables. And as we're talking about the stories of Jesus, we mentioned almost every time, <clears throat> the story wasn't given just to be entertained us. The story is really not the story. The story is told to illustrate a point that really is the story. <clears throat> so we've got to uncover these parables, what the real story is. Now the first one I want to look at, first thing I want to notice is that <clears throat> good leaders have enemies too. You thought you were the only one that had an enemy? Now I, I had a, a professor who said, this is the definition of an enemy. Somebody who makes it their full-time occupation to make your life miserable. That is an enemy. Ever had one of those? Somebody that just makes full-time occupation to make your life miserable? Good leaders have enemies too. It's not just us, the little guy. Anybody know who this is? Now this guy had a lot of enemies. Uh, our former president, Barack Obama, as uh, soon as he took office, the opposition party, which would have been the Republicans, immediately said it was their number one objective to make sure he didn't get reelected again. Remember that? Immediately. It's not like, oh, we're going to work with you, try to get something done in America. We're out to stop you. Anybody know who this is? <laughs> Did you notice that as soon as he took office, the other party, which... Now became, another party, Democrats, now became the opposition party to him. And their primary objective is, we're going to stop, try to stop anything that you want to do. It's a funny thing. Politicians only care about 51% majority. That's all they care about, 51%. You see, they, they, have, they have enemies too. People who are out to make their life miserable. Nothing has changed. Jesus had enemies too. People that were out to make things difficult. And it wasn't just the other party. As we're going to find out, it's, it's just about everybody. One day, as he was teaching the people in the temple courts and preaching the gospel, the good news. I mean, he, he's He's telling good news, right? The chief priests, that's one group of people. The teachers of the law, that's another group of people. That, that would be like your uh, scholars. And then it says, together with the elders. Now the elders formed a group called the Sanhedrin. And there was a number of them, and they were the ruling body in Jerusalem as a puppet government under the Roman government that had control over them. So already he's got three groups of people here that we're going to find out in this text are out to get him. Now, we've been talking through all these parables that Jesus constantly is referring to the Pharisees. The Pharisees are the extreme right-wingers. Okay, politically and religiously. There's another group called the Sadducees. They're the extreme left-wingers. They both didn't like Jesus either. This group, because he wasn't conservative enough, he didn't dot every I and cross every T like they did. This group over here was the progressives. Jesus believed in the resurrection, and they did not believe in the resurrection. They were the progressive left-wingers, and everybody, it seems like, doesn't like Jesus. Isn't that amazing? I put up their good leaders, remember that? 
you remember that the, the young man came to Jesus one time and says, good teacher. And Jesus stopped and said, why do you call me good? There's none good except God. Jesus is the good leader because he is the son of God. Everything he does is good. All his leadership is good. And you can be a good leader and not have a good father. Wow. Wow. So these, I call them bad leaders. They come and they challenge God's authority. You see, to challenge Jesus' authority is to challenge God's authority. And they say, tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Now, the, the, the term authority, we, we would say, what rights do you have to be at our temple preaching and teaching? See, that, what rights? We wouldn't say, what authority are you doing? This is what we'd say, what, what gives you the right to do this? And that's exactly what they're doing. They're saying that. Now, this is a trap question. You know, it's kind of like special counsel. You know what I'm talking about, the government today? When they can't find one thing, they go after other things because sooner or later we're going to find something. It was true with, you know, President um, Carter. and It's true now with what's going on. We're going to find something. They're setting him up with a trick question here. Tell us by what authority you are doing these things. If Jesus says, well, I don't have any authority, so they're going to throw them out of the temple. Wait, wait. They say, what was it really saying? Is, what school did you go to? Who did you study? Oh, what, what, who gives you the right to stand in the temple and do this? And if he says, well, no one has done that, then they're going to say, we might as well throw you out of here. You have no right to be in the temple doing this. And they get rid of them. Now, if he says, well, God has given this to me, then they're going to run to the Romans and say, we got a, a guy in the temple proclaiming himself to be the Messiah. And, and isn't Caesar king? How could you have this king in there? And they're going to try to get rid of Either way, they're trying to get rid of Jesus. You see what's going on here? These people are not Jesus, all right? Tell us by what authority you do these things. Who gave you this authority? Now, I want to look at how Jesus responds to those who are out to get him. There's a way to respond when people are out to get you. And I'm going to learn that as a, one of the lessons in this passage. And then we're going to learn something even deeper as we go through this passage. But how does he respond? And he responds with a rebuttal question. What does he replies? And he answers a question with a question, or he gives a question to their question. He replied, he said, I will also ask you a question. Tell me, John the Baptist, baptism, was it from heaven or was it from men? So he's turned the table on them and he's responded to their question with the question, which creates a serious dilemma for them. They discussed it among themselves and they say, hmm, if we say John the Baptist was from heaven, he's going to say, well, why didn't you believe him? But if we say he's from men, all the people will stone us because they are persuaded that John was a prophet. He has turned the tables on them. You see how he's done that? He's answered a question with a question. He's turned the tables. He's created a serious dilemma, which is going to, on their part, receive a cowardly answer. Here's what they said. We don't know where it was from. often say if it's a good question, it probably won't get a good answer. Isn't that right? Yeah, questions are easy, answers are hard. There's no such thing as a difficult question. That's the answer to it. <clears throat> they, to answer this question, would actually expose their true identity, and they don't want to do that. So they take the cowardly way out, which foiled the whole trap. So then Jesus says, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. If you're not going to tell me the answer, then I'm not going to tell you the answer. So they, he foils their trap to get him thrown out of the temple because he had a good rebuttal question. There's an application here. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says this, Behold, I send you, the disciples, out as sheep in the midst of wolves. There are people out to get you. 
Therefore be as wise as a snake and harmless as a dove. Listen, a Christian should not be stupid. Right? We should think things through. We should ask, what is the real motive behind the question? And dig deep, because Jesus did the same. He was looking to the motive, what was going on behind the question. There's another interesting passage that I think is a good application. In Proverbs 26, we got two verses that seem to contradict each other. Now, a person were reading through the Bible, and you said there's no contradictions in the Bible, they would probably pull this verse out and say, do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you will be like, like him yourself. Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. So it says, well, don't answer him and do answer. Which one am I supposed to do? Well, you're supposed to do both. Do not answer a fool according to his folly. Jesus did not answer those fools who were trying to trap him the way they wanted him to so that they could, he could be trapped. But he didn't let them off. He answers them with a question so that their eyes are opened and exposes their foolishness. He actually does that. And folks, we're going to have to do this from time to time. Well, when do you know, how do you know to do the different one, to do one or do the other? That's where you need to have the wisdom of God, the Word of God, planted in your heart and your mind so that you know which path to take in circumstances that arise every day. And believe me, it says in, in Timothy, the second letter to Timothy, the Apostle Paul writes, everyone who lives godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Someone will be out to get you. Jesus said, if they hated me, if they hate you, they hated me before they hated you. Because if, if they hated him, they will hate you when you live like him. Let's move on. Jesus not only responded with a question, but Jesus also responded to those who were out, who were out to get him with a telling story. And here's where we pick up on the parable. He went on to tell the people this parable. I will suggest that the parable is really about God. It's a story to illustrate about God. A man, okay, God, God is represented by a man in the story. You've got to plug that into your mind. A man planted a vineyard. You know, of course, a vineyard is where you grow grapes and you get your jellies, jams, and wine, and grape juice, and all of that. A man planted a vineyard. And in the story, the vineyard represents Jerusalem. It represents the Jewish people. It represents that nation that Jesus had come to. It's about a man, God, who planted or has a nation of the Jews, and he rented it to some farmers. He lent it to the leaders in Jerusalem that were asking him this trick question. All right? It says he rented it out to a leadership in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem had been the capital of, of, of Israel for almost a thousand years. David established it as a capital in around 1000 BC. And Jesus is about, you know, in the early days. So it's been a, a thousand years. And for a thousand years, God has sent servants. They're called prophets. At the harvest time, a servant was sent to the tenants so that they would give him some fruit. Now, what's the fruit that he wants? God wants righteousness and holiness. He wants integrity and honor and justice. He wants truthfulness. He wants all these wonderful qualities. He, he wants righteousness. So he sends his prophets, and the prophets are preaching and asking for the people to repent and turn to God. He wants righteousness. He wants the fruit from the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. So the prophet was beaten. So what does he do? In the story he says, well, he sent another servant. As God sent another prophet. Did you ever notice that there's a bunch of prophets in the book of the Bible? Each one of these prophets is sent by God. And he's got the message, repent, turn your heart to God. God wants righteousness. He sent another servant. But the one also, but that, but that one also was beaten, treated shamefully, and they sent away empty-handed. Still, it says, 
he sent a third prophet, a third servant. And they wounded him and they threw him out. Now, if the Bible in Bible time there had been baseball, so baseball season will be here, spring training has already started, right? But if there had been baseball, you would have had this expression, three strikes and you're out. Three sets of prophets, three times he said this. And you're expecting him to say, okay, that's it, that's all I can handle. But instead he says, then the owner of the vineyard, who is in the story God, he said, what shall I do? I will send my son. Who's the son? Jesus is the son. He's the son of God. He's the one telling the story. He's telling the story about himself. The father, the owner of the vineyard, will say, well, what will I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect my son. This is powerful. But when the tenants saw, they talked the man over. This is the ear. You know what the Bible says? Heaven is his throne, earth is his footstool. It says that he's put everything under Jesus' authority. This, this is the ear. He's going to inherit everything. So they said, let's kill him. And the inheritance will be ours. Rather than let him be king of the Jews. Remember when they crucified him and put the placard above his head? The king of the Jews? And they ran to him and said, no, no, just write that. He said that he was king of the Jews. Not that he is. And by the way, I've written, I've written. The king, okay? Let us kill him so that we, these leaders in Jerusalem with the priests, that they could rule their puppet kingdom under the Roman Empire. And so he goes on, Jesus is telling us the, the, the story. So they threw him out of the vineyard. Jesus took up his cross. You know the story. He's walking through the streets of Jerusalem. He falls under it because it's so heavy. And Simon of Serene is grabbed, pulled. He's going to carry the cross of Jesus because he couldn't carry himself. They threw him out of the vineyard, out of Jerusalem, so that Jesus goes outside the city to a place called Golgotha, and there he is going to be killed on the cross, dying for not his sin because he was sinless, but dying for our sins because we are sinful. So they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. They killed him. And Jesus follows this up with an incriminating question. He asked them, What then will the owner, who's the owner? God. God. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? It's a rhetorical question. And he gives the answer, Jesus does. He will come and kill those tenants. Judgment is coming. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Everyone, one day, is going to give an account to God for what they do. And in this story, he's saying, he will kill. Those tenants are going to face judgment, and he's going to take this, this vineyard from them, and watch what he says, and he give it to another. Who are the others? The faithful, the faithful followers of Jesus Christ. At this point, he shifts from the leaders, those who are out to get him, and we're told about the people. The people. And the people heard this and said, May it never be that they would kill the son of the owner. I'm not even sure they're registering everything in their minds because they don't have hindsight like we do that Jesus died and fulfills all the story that he's telling, but they are aghast that anyone would kill the owner's son. And yet the story that Jesus is telling is about what we will be celebrating here on Good Friday, that he went to the cross and he died to bear our sins so that we, by believing in him, receiving him, might have life eternal. Wow. The crowd is sympathetic 
So Jesus has given them a rebuttal question. He's given them a telling story. He's exposing. He's exposing. Still, another way he responds to those who are out to get him is that he backs it all up with scripture, a scriptural prophecy. Jesus looked directly at them. I don't know what that book might have looked like. But I can remember when I would get in trouble in church, and you know, there were five of us kids, and my mom and my dad, my dad leaned his head down and gave a look, you knew you were dead. <laughs> if you mis mis misbehaved your man, you knew, oh, after church, you were going to get it. Jesus looks them in their eye directly, and he asks them, what then is the meaning of that which is written? And he quotes a Messianic psalm, Psalm 118, verse 22. And in that psalm it says this. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The stone. As far back as Daniel chapter 2, there was going to be a kingdom set up on the earth. And it's called the stone kingdom because the Messiah is represented as a stone. And this stone is cut out of a mountain. A mountain is a, a metaphor for a kingdom. There's going to be a coming kingdom with a king who that, that stone is going to strike the image. It was a tall image that represented all the nations of the earth. He's going to strike it on the feet and he's going to totally destroy all the nations of the earth. This stone is the Messiah who was to come. And he's quoting from Psalm 118. He says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. Capstone is taken in several different ways. I have it here as the keystone, as the capstone. When you're building an arch, you cap it off. In fact, that little ledge on the top of that capstone is why it's called a capstone. It's got a little cap on there. You see that cap? On the very top of that keystone, at the very top. He is the keystone. It all holds together because of him. He caps it off. The other idea in the same word is that it's the cornerstone. And that is it. Our building has a cornerstone outside. It's a marker stone. It, it's the most important one. It's a dedication stone. It tells what this place is all about, when it happened, what, how it was done. It's that cornerstone. He, he is like the foundation cornerstone. He's the cap that completes it. He is everything to the structure. So saying, you can't have the kingdom of God without the king. You can't have an arch without the keystone. You can't have a building without a foundation, a cornerstone. You've got to have it. And this messianic one is saying, the stone, the capstone, was rejected. Was rejected. So I took this, the capstone out. You see it? It's gone. Capstone's gone. They had rejected that which holds everything together. In fact, it goes on and says that everyone who falls on that stone will be broken into pieces. It's kind of like, all right, they're putting the, 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 the edifice together and the capstone. The builder saw it and said, this is an odd-shaped stone. We don't know where it goes. So they kind of just roll it a little bit out of the way because sooner or later will fit in somewhere. And while they're building, they're constantly stumbling over it. Every time they turn around, they're stubbing their toe over that which is the most important. And that's exactly what these Jews were doing. They're stumbling over their Messiah. They're stumbling over the truth. It's right there in their face and they're stumbling over it. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. But, uh, but he on whom it falls. You see, without that stone in its proper place, the rest of the structure comes crashing down. And it comes crashing down and destroys them. It crushes them. The stone that's holding everything together, in their case, is the very one who destroys everything. Destroys everything. You cannot stand neutral with Jesus. You cannot stand neutral with Jesus. He's either the capstone or the stumbling stone, the crushing stone. You can't stand neutral with Jesus. You can't do it. Here's the reaction. The teachers of the law and the chief priests look for a way to arrest him immediately. They're ticked. They want to get him out of the temple. They want 
Why? Because they knew he had spoken this parable, the story about the vineyard against them. They knew that they didn't get, get their head completely around it, but they knew that this was not complimentary to them. But they didn't do anything because they were afraid of all the people. They were afraid of all the people. Kept them in check. It comes out to this, this whole story. It really comes out to this. It started out with all his authority, but it comes down to this. You either reject him, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. They stumbled over him. He crushed them. The next verse says this, yet to all who receive him. Then there's a gloss. You know what a gloss is? Gloss means a glossary. It's a definition within the verse itself to explain a part of the verse. So we call this a gloss. To those who believe in his name, that is a definition of what it means to receive Jesus. All right? Yet to all who receive him, that's who believe in his name, they believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, who went to the cross and died on the cross, paid for your sins, was buried, rose again the third day, and has life everlasting, that he, if you turn to him and receive him in faith as your Savior, he will save you from your sins, and you will be given the right to become a child of God. Isn't this amazing? Yes. It comes down to this. Do you reject the stone, or do you put the stone in its proper place? Which will it be? Which will it be? It is Jesus a stumbling stone? you got to ask yourself, is he the stumbling block in your life? I I'm having difficulty in my life because every time I turn around, I'm stumbling over Jesus? I don't have him in the right place in my life? Or have you put him in the right place so he's the capstone and he's holding your whole life together? That's the question. On one hand, is he your problem? He's the missing ingredient. And, and so your life is just full of problems. And is he the problem? And you're blaming it all on a bit. Is he the problem in your life? Or is he the solution? Does he make it all work together for good? Is he your judge? A crushing stone. Or is he your savior, the rescuer, the deliverer? You can make him your capstone. You can make him the solution. You can make him your savior today. <coughs> Just do what that little verse John 1 12 said. Receive him. Believe in his name. And you will become a child of God. He makes all the difference in the world. You can do that simply by praying. That's what we'll do right now. If you would like to make him the capstone in your life, the solution to your problems, your Savior, you can do that right now. You pray some little prayer like this, say the Lord. I need you to save me from the way I have messed up my life. Rescue me. I will make you the capstone, the cornerstone. I will put you first so that you can solve the puzzle of my life. You will be my Savior. I need it, Lord. I give my life to you. Lord, we know that when anyone prays anything similar to that, it's not a magical prayer. It's the faith in the heart that saves. You read the heart. You see the faith. And you make that person a child of God. I ask that you would do that sovereign work today here, right now, in our midst. Someone here would just do that little prayer.
express their faith and be saved today. Some of us, Lord, have uh, been saved for some time. Sometimes we still misplace the stone to have you at the, the keystone and our lives go awry. Help us put you back where you belong. Put that puzzle piece in of Jesus to complete our lives. Take that ring of a lifesaver. Hold on tight for the ride of our life from our Savior. Bless us in these ways, I pray. In Jesus' name.